So what I thought I'd do now is just uh, walk you through um, each of the chapters. Um, I'll obviously spend different time with them, uh, but just to go over some of the sort of key issues and give you a flavor of things. Um, obviously, I start with an introduction, which uh, I've just given you a version of right now, looking at some of the issues of what entertainment is, uh, why we study it, how we study it, and so forth. Uh, the first major chapter, then, is on creativity, innovation, and industry. And what I'm trying to get at in this chapter is the degree to which television entertainment is, at one and the same time, both an art and something that needs to be studied as an art. And, and uh, in other words, we need to study, study it with a humanistic uh, toolbox, but also something that's an industry and that needs to be studied as an industry with a social scientific uh, toolbox. You know, television entertainment and TV in a whole has a sort of incredible pressure to be creative, almost unrivaled in, in art history. Uh, given the number of channels that exist, the fact that they need to broadcast 24-7, uh, we have this incredible creative, uh, incredible pressure to be creative. But the president pressure isn't just artistic. Indeed, in the American commercial for profit television model, it's first and foremost to make money. Uh, yet we can get bogged down if we see only this desire to make money. Uh, after all, not everyone in TV is there just to make money. Some, uh, perhaps even many of the people who work on TV, care about art uh, and want to make art. Uh, in addition to making money. Uh, indeed, uh, any artistic profession could, in theory, be open to the same attack, that it's there just for money. Uh, we need to try and balance off these two imperatives, then. One, to make money and to do so proficiently. Uh, two, to make art and do so well and beautifully. So the point of this chapter is to look at how that works, to see what forces in American television entertainment uh, work for art uh, and what works against it. So I start by looking at who does what and how a show goes from an idea to the studio to the network or other broadcaster to an audience. I feel that if we're going to analyze this process and analyze how the process can get sidestepped, how it can get moved, how people can interfere with it, we obviously need to start with what the process is. So I start with that. And then I sort of look at, you know, again, this broad thematic tension between uh, art and industry. Uh, and I think in many ways we can see this as starting with the industry's fear of risk um, and yet a need to innovate. And so this sort of paradoxical, you know, these pulling uh, tensions. Um, many industries have found it, of course, beneficial to standardize their products, in part because this standardizes audience expectations. Uh, the minute that uh, you are offering something that changes radically, uh, you lose the ability as an industry to predict how audiences are going to react, what they're going to buy, and so forth. So in, in any industry, uh, in any field, it becomes uh, beneficial to try and, and standardize. For television, therefore, if an audience likes product A, it makes sense that you're going to give them more of product A, <clears throat> whether that be through sequels, spin-offs, franchises, rip-offs. A television, let's remember, is very expensive, and thus it's a risky business. A lot of shows fail, and thus industry tries to limit the risk in order to make money. But standardization, of course, works against art, or so it would seem. Art is usually that which lets us see something with new eyes. It defamiliarizes. It's provocative, perhaps controversial. It's bold. And thus industry and arts are, art are often at odds. And yet at the same time, it's too easy to end the story there. After all, there are artists in the industry who are motivated by artistic impulses, who have things to say. We might also need to change our fetishized notions of originality and creativity. And I try and push at this somewhat in the chapter. I'm trying to get us to realize that uh, these usually come via small changes, not necessarily grand ones. Uh, think of the Mona Lisa. It's a bust of a woman. Uh, which is one of the most tired genres in art history. Uh, Michelangelo's David is a sculpture of a naked guy. Uh, Hamlet is a tale about revenge. There's nothing bold about such things. But the creativity, the mastery, the art in all three of these lies in small choices. And so too with television, why might we need to look at the small differences, not assume that everything's going to be starkly different and not look for these massive differences, but that realize in sequels, rip-offs, etc., we might find 
you know, still uh, the, the wonderful sort of acorn of, of creativity. Uh, we could look at the lighting and the tonal differences between CSI and CSI Miami and see two different products. Um, so we're encumbered in looking at art on TV by setting impossibly and foolishly lofty goals sometimes. And yet, I don't want to argue that therefore we should let the industry off the hook. We shouldn't stop looking at how the system kills originality. Uh, so I do that too. And thus I try to navigate a path between artistic impulses and industrial pressures to get readers thinking about how active a battle this is and how variable the outcomes can be. You know, as part of looking at industrial pressures, I also look at the effects of advertising. Um, American television dances to the advertiser's drum, let us remember. So we need to look at what beat and what rhythm that drum sets. And I look at what happens to the creative process when it is so communal, involving literally hundreds of people making decisions about one show. Towards the end of the chapter, I bring this to a head by looking at how the Sopranos dealt with some of the challenges. And throughout the chapter, and indeed throughout the book, I make frequent references to other contemporary TV shows. And then to close off the chapter, I then have sections first on, on public broadcasting and how that as a system changes some dynamics from a commercial system. And then secondly, I look at uh, reruns. You know, especially if we're after a theory of creativity, it's easy to fall into the trap of looking only at new shows. But of course, as Derek Compare's brilliant book, Rerun Nation, reminds us, much of television is full of reruns, uh, which allows us to revisit the idea that stark originality is even what viewers want. And so I consider the importance and appeal of TV's version of comfort food at the end. And then that's basically chapter one. Um, I'll now try to talk about the other chapters. Um, and turning first to, uh, or next rather, to uh, chapter two, which is about affect, fantasy, and meaning.